in that album, faith is an island in the setting sun, proof is the bottom line for everyone. I remember when I first started recognizing the powerful connection between faith and social action, and I mentioned it to, uh, to somebody, eyes got cross-eyed, and they were like, you know, are you going to go join the Flat Earth Society? Right? So the, the notion of the importance of religion, it was just marginalized. And the salience of religious diversity, just nobody talked about it. I'll never forget, I was an RA in college, and so much of what we did is, is our, how many of you are RAs, by the way? Okay, right, I mean, like, that's like leadership, not just development, but it's like, like the leadership hothouse, right? And so a lot of what you talk about is, is identity. And so we're in one of these RA identity circles, and people are talking about what it feels like to be African American, or Latina, or, uh, or gay. And my friend Kizer uh, talks about what it's like to be Muslim. And folks just didn't know what to do with that. They weren't hostile. They just gave him a blank stare. Like, what, why would you talk about your religious identity in the open? I mean, do people still really care about this? I mean, back at that time in the early 1990s, America was still under the notion of secularization theory, you know? And uh, we just know that's not true anymore. We just know that religion, and especially just to say how people who orient around religion differently are going to interact with one another, that's going to play a major role in the world. It plays a major role in our personal lives. It plays a major role in our homes. It plays a major role in domestic and foreign policy. You know, uh, Madeleine Albright, after she was Secretary of State, writes a book called The Mighty and the Almighty. And uh, she says, it was crazy looking back at my time as Secretary of State in the 1990s. I had literally entire cadres of economic experts and non-proliferation experts to choose from in the State Department, dozens and dozens of these people. I had exactly one in, in a, in a di diplomacy corps of tens of thousands, exactly one person I could call a religion expert. She's like, that's just not being able to do diplomacy well. John Kerry said, the current Secretary of State, that if he could go back to school, he'd study comparative religions. Right? What does that mean? That means we've lived through this great revolution. And that revolution is the salience and significance of religious diversity. And I got to tell you, you know, we're, we're on the vanguard of that, right? There, there are a lot of folks who still haven't, this still hasn't fully clicked for them, which is one of the reasons I loved reading this sermon, right? Because King is articulating the power of a world community. This is in 1968, again, a month before he's uh, assassinated. This is the Washington National Cathedral. He's articulating the power of this new paradigm that's coming. And he's saying not everybody sees this yet. But let me tell you something. We are living in it right now, and some of us have to see it clearly. And those of us who see it clearly, we have to develop the new paradigms, the new attitudes, the new skills to be able to live into that new world. So what does it mean if a world of religious diversity, a world in which people who, you know, who orient around religion differently interact with each other with frequency and intensity, and when, in which that interaction can become, as Adam said, a bomb of destruction, or a bubble of isolation, or a barrier of division, or we hope a bridge of cooperation, what does it mean to have the worldview, the attitude, the skill set, the paradigms to be able to navigate that? So at IFYC, we've boiled this down to three things. Voice, engage, and act. And one of the things that we think is really, really powerful is the ability to tell your own story, as Adam and Janan did so beautifully. One of the things I love about working at IFYC, I, I love about doing interfaith work, period, is that you can know somebody for seven years, as long as I've known Janan, and I haven't heard that story told that exact way before ever, right? I've known Adam for three years now, right? And I haven't heard that story told that exact way ever. We discover stuff about each other and frankly about ourselves all the time, but the ability to voice, to kind of discover, articulate, find one's own identity in a world of diversity and then to offer it gently and instructively to others to kind of have your identity, to articulate yourself, to have a voice. That storytelling is just so central to being able to live in this world. And again, I think back to, to those RA circles where, where people were struggling uh, powerfully and beautifully with telling their stories about being, again, black or Latino or Native American or growing up on the other side of the tracks. And, we didn't have a space where people could tell their faith or philosophical stories, right? So we're on the vanguard of being those storytellers. 
The second thing that we think is absolutely key to being able to flow in a world of religious diversity is the ability to engage with other folks, the ability to build relationships with them. I wanna talk about two dimensions of this. One is the knowledge dimension. So, so knowledge isn't everything, right? But, but it's something. And, and to know something that you admire, that you find beautiful about another tradition. I mean, think, but think about Adam's story, right? What if that other person had a theological belief that Mormons fall outside of the circle of Christianity? And he had said, boy, I admire the commitment to family in the Mormon tradition. I have, I have theological disagreements, by the way, if you work in religious diversity, you are going to have theological disagreements, right? You cannot have water without the wet. May I remind you of that, right? So like this is, that's the deal, right? There are going to be theological disagreements. That doesn't mean that you can't find something you find beautiful or that you admire or that you, you love about another tradition. This is the thing I love so much about King, right? He has profound theological disagreements with Gandhi. And there are things about Hinduism that he learns to admire and love and find beautiful. And I think in a world in which people from different religious backgrounds are crashing into each other all the time, being able to say, here is something I find beautiful about Judaism, something I find beautiful about Islam, something I find beautiful about secular humanism, something I admire. That knowledge, you know, um, it's a powerful thing, right? And the second thing I want to talk about when it comes to engage is, you know, what does it mean to learn to build a relationship with somebody you disagree with? You know, I want to say a couple words about this. My, my, my new favorite line, my staff is going to roll their eyes because I've said it a thousand times, but diversity is not just interesting ethnic restaurants, right? <laughs> diversity means disagreement. And if you deal with religious diversity, and you think about what, what religion points to, you know, the great scholar and theologian Paul Tillich said religion deals with ultimate concerns. It deals with fundamental things. So you put those two things together and you know why your mom told you never to talk about religion, right? Because if you're gonna deal with religious diversity, you're going to bump up against disagreements on fundamental things all the time. You can't have the water without getting wet. So what's the challenge of somebody who is able to flow in that world of diversity? It's the ability to build a relationship with somebody you disagree with. And by the way, something that matters a lot to you. To disagree with somebody doesn't mean that you necessarily come to their side. It probably means that they're not going to come to your side on a whole set of things. It means you recognize there's a disagreement and decide that you want to build a relationship anyway engagement. The third thing we think that's important about a world of religious diversity and developing the skills and the mindset and the attitudes for it is the ability to act together. And of course, this comes out of our personal stories. It comes out of the voice part and it comes out of the engage part, right? Because one of the reasons that you want to engage somebody that you disagree with is because there are other things you might do together. I think to myself, you know, if you look at what has happened with deaths related to malaria over the last 10 years, they've fallen like 40 to 50%. You wanna know why that is? Because there's an interfaith movement in no small part in places like the United States with programs like Nothing But Nets where people, a lot of them kids, giving just a couple dollars to help get anti-malarial bed nets to sub-Saharan Africa. But it's largely because Christian pastors and Muslim imams in sub-Saharan Africa who disagree on an awful lot of things recognize that they have something profound in common, which is they don't want four-year-old kids to die from malaria. So they will act together on that, right? Voice, engage, act. We think that those three words are the constellation of skills, attitudes, uh, worldviews that are especially necessary for thriving in a world of religious diversity. So one of the lines that I love the most in that sermon, uh, the sermon that I've been reading, um, fall, remaining awake during a great revolution, is King says, you know, people think that progress just happens. People think that, you know, time heals wounds. He says, you know, Nothing rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. 
Progress doesn't roll in on the wheels of inevitability. Time heals nothing. People do things with time. People roll progress in on the wheels of inevitability. The pendulum doesn't swing. People push it. That's why we talk about leadership. And that's why ultimately, like, we're not asking you to just learn how to voice, engage, and act for yourself. We're asking you to create spaces where other people learn how to do it. In the next three days, you're going to learn how to voice, engage, act. A lot of you know that already. A lot of you are going to strengthen those skills. But the big thing that we're saying is that you need to build campus cultures. And one day, cities and states and regions and nations where people can live into this world of religious diversity. That's what we call it the Better Together campaign, right? How do you build spaces where people who orient around religion differently can come into those spaces, they can voice their values, they can tell their stories, they can engage one another, understanding that there are profound disagreements, and they can act together. And as I was flying here, I was thinking to myself, that moment in so many ways happened for me in this city when I was a college student. I want to tell you this story. So I was 20 years old. Uh, it was the, maybe 19. It was the summer of my sophomore year in college, uh, 1990, summer of 95. And uh, I had deeply connected to faith and social action. And I was basically doing a research project going to faith and social action communities all over the country. And I spent some time here in Atlanta at something called the Open Door Community. Anybody heard of the Open Door Community? Folks know that, Atlanta folks. So Ed Loring and Murphy Davis. And I, they're not going to remember, you know, a skinny, pimply Indian kid who came through in 1995. But they changed my life. I spent a week with them, and I saw this evangelical Protestant community in action, right? Um, uh, not just not, not serving, but ministering to, loving. Uh, the Vietnam vets, the homeless folks, the addicts who came to their door. And I loved the prayers, and I loved the songs, and I loved waking up at 5 in the morning to prepare the food for the soup kitchen. I was there all week. And I, I said at the end of that week to, to Ed, I said, I'd like to come back next summer. And he said, sit down, let's have a conversation. He said, uh, you're not Christian, are you? And I'm like, no. He's like, yeah, I can tell. I, I just, right? This is back to the skinny, pimply Indian kid part, right? Um, he's like, you know, you, you bow your head during our prayer, and you kind of hum along out of tune when we sing, you know? It's like, but I, I can tell that, um, that while you, there's something in that that feeds you, it's just not, it's, you didn't grow up with it, and, and he's like, you're not really interested in becoming Christian. I'm like, I'm, I'm not really. He said, okay. So I have some advice for you. It's like, you can come back next summer. You're welcome, right? We're a Christian community, and that's the well that we drink from. And the sense that I get from you, kid, is that you want to do work that improves and enriches and moves the world for your life. And if you're going to do that, you need to find a well that sustains you. And if it's not going to be the Christian well, that's okay. It's like, if it, if it was, I would invite you in, right? Part of my job is to bring people into the magic circle of Christianity. But as I look at you, I think to myself, you got to find a well for you to drink from. And that, in so many ways, was my journey back to Islam. And I think to myself, I went to that community to act, right? I found myself engaging with religious difference and disagreement, including the kind where somebody drew a line and said, this is who we are. And I, I so love them for doing that because their ability to be clear with their identity created the freedom for me to be able to be clear. And it's in that process that I began to find my voice. So I just want to say that sometimes this thing happens in reverse. You can start at various points in the triangle. You can start with engage, you can move to action, you can from there develop a voice. You can develop your voice, you can move to action, you can then engage. But for me, this city is very, very, very special. Because when I was 19, there was that stark moment of somebody looking at me and saying, I think that this the path that we are on in this community and the well that we drink from is not the exact one for you. You're communicating that and signaling it in on a variety of ways. And I invite you to go find that well. So Ed Loring, Murphy Davis, wherever you are, know that I'm not that skinny anymore. You know, thank God my skin cleared up a little bit more. 
but I so appreciate the model that, that you put into the world, the love that you put into the world, and, and you're sitting down for a few minutes with a young person and helping me find my voice in my way. So here's what I want to end with. Um, you know, so I think Martin Luther King Jr. was the greatest American of the 20th century. Uh, and this city gave rise to him. And on the other side of the world, I think the greatest person of the 20, 20th century died about a month ago, right? And his work had an awful lot to do with Martin Luther King Jr.'s inspiration. As I read all of that stuff about Mandela uh, during the time of his passing, I thought to myself, I had a brief moment in 1999 in a room of 10,000 people with Mandela, and he came all regally to the podium. Right? And he stood at that podium, and a man in the back uh, stood up and he started to sing a Kosa Prey song with the, the tribe that Mandela is from. And Mandela cocks his head to the side, like the African chief that he, he is. And he listened and he kind of nodded his head and he closed his eyes as if to say, you know, for the 90 years of my life, these prey songs have flowed through my blood and my veins, and I appreciate hearing this now. And then he pointed out into the Cape out to where Robben Island was. And he said, I spent 25 years in that prison. And if it wasn't for a movement of Muslims and Christians, of Jews and Hindus, of African traditionalists and atheists and people of all other faiths and hues and stocks, I would not be here today. And South Africa would not be free. And that's why we do the work that we do, because we are better together and in that, we achieve great things. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu. We'll take a few questions from the ground if someone has one. Just raise your hand and we'll bring a mic. Thank you, Ibu, so much. I, um, I want to ask a question that uh, that's intended to be, um, it, it's an it's a insolidarity question, but it's a serious one that we're facing in Atlanta, and I think that the interfaith and nonviolent movement really struggles with, and that is the fearful commodification of figures like Martin Luther King and Mandela, where it is so easy to celebrate the work of these great individuals at a time of unprecedented state power, extrajudicial killings, you know, breaking of international law, all kinds of things that happen, and the same powers that, you know, perpetuate those kind of ills, perpetuate, you know, conflict long term, are the same ones that promote these individuals. How do we stand guard against that as a movement of self critique? So, um, you know, Cornell West calls this the Santa Clausification of Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela, right? So, so uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if everybody agrees with everything that you just said. And the wonderful thing is that's the definition of diversity, right? So I think what's, what's powerful and interesting, what I mean by that is maybe other people have different views of, of the variety of political things that you, that you put on the table. Uh, and, and I find it powerful and beautiful that there's uh, a room full of people, and frankly, a country full of people who has a range of different views on a range of different topics and still says, we got to be a city and a state and a country. And I think that in this room, Pete, the way that you might be inspired by King or Mandela or Jesus or the Prophet Muhammad, those are stories that people get to tell uh, in the ways that they're inspired by those folks. I am inspired by King and Mandela in so many ways. But the way that's most salient for me as somebody who founded an interfaith organization is the way that they worked with people who were religiously different than them uh, in the service of common values, right? So I would just say we, you know, Rumi says uh, uh, there are many ways to tell my story, right? You can tell it as a, a love poem or a dirty joke. And, and one of the things that will happen a lot in the next 72 hours is a lot of different kinds of storytelling, which will, which will reveal uh, a number of different interesting values and in which I hope the overriding value is, wow, that's, that is a powerful area of difference and disagreement, and we have to work together anyway.
Mr. Patel, um, I have a question regarding, um, I'm very active on my Clayton State University campus, and I don't really see a need that needs to be met so far as religious um, acceptance, because everyone seems to really, we're a very diverse university, and everyone seems to um, accept each other very well. Um, so when do you know when it's the right time to really make a movement on your campus to better the university? That's a great, so thank you. That's a great question. So. I think sometimes we do things in order to right a wrong. In other words, if there's like clear and obvious prejudice, you do something to right that wrong. I think sometimes you do things that you say, look, we're at a reasonably good place, but we could be a lot better, right? And so I'll be really geeky with you on this, but uh, one of the reasons we, I think people do interfaith work is to, is, is to what we call bridge social capital, that, that communities who are oriented around religion differently, uh, uh, they, they do a lot of good in the world alone how much good could they do if they work together? That's one of the reasons I love the kind of the, the one region interfaith campaign that the greater community, found, the, the, the foundation for, for Atlanta, I'm getting that name wrong here. Thank you. <laughs> we have a different way of phrasing that in Chicago. The Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta, it's, it's not, they're not just responding to something that they think is terribly wrong. They're saying, look, with the diversity that we have across Atlanta, how much better could we be if we bridge this, if we work together, right? So I, there, there's probably a bunch of people in this room who are like, boy, we wish we had your problem, you know? Uh, because there, there, there's folks who are like, look, there, there are like outright things on our campus that we feel like we need to address and right that wrong or fix that. Uh, uh, what would, it, if you have a broad sense of quote unquote religious acceptance, you know, it might be a straighter and shorter path from acceptance to cooperation. Let me say one more thing, which is scratch the surface on religious acceptance, you might find some other things, right? So I'm not saying like go look for the, the demon in the hills, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? But I'm just saying like ask a question or two, you know? Ask a question or two. Other questions? Raise your hand, we'll come to you. Oh. Um, I have a question regarding, so I'm in a pretty, I'm in rural Appalachia, so it's, it's a, just kind of a buzzy place there. Um, in terms of whenever you uh, try to craft like an interfaith Thanksgiving celebration or something, sometimes I worry about how to frame it such that you're creating positive engagement, but without, yeah. sometimes I worry that even when you're doing something positive, it kind of forces other people to overcorrect such that it actually like creates more extremism in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. So how do you frame yourself such that yeah. you create a positive thing, but without like forcing, yeah, like, that's oh, we such, have to fight that. Yeah, Th thank you for that. It's such a great question, right? Um, and so, so one of the, if, if, you'll, if you'll allow me to like come at this through the side door, usually I do that when the question is too hard and I'm not smart enough to answer it directly. <laughs> so I'm gonna like come in through the side door on this and I'm gonna say, uh, you know, people will say to IFYC staff, they'll like say to Adam or Janan when they see him on stage, they'll be like, you know, can you come to my, to my small town in rural Oregon? And the answer is generally no. Wanna know why? because you're in your small town in rural Oregon. And, and we believe what we're collectively doing is kind of, if you will, singing a song of interfaith cooperation that people are gonna find local riffs off of, and you're gonna know that a whole lot better than we will. So if the term interfaith doesn't fly in, in where you are, don't use it, right? What, what's, the, what's the nut here? The nut is, are you finding ways where people who orient around religion differently can come together such that there's greater understanding and cooperation. For some folks, that can be uh, a campaign around, uh, uh, around anti-malarial bed nets. For other folks, that can be just, just a different kind of meal. I and mean, one of the things that you will learn here is, uh, is a variety of kind of dialogue and service and social action approaches, so to speak. And, and one of the things that we will learn is how you, what you guys are doing where you are works. So, you know, use the language, the framing, et cetera, that, that works. There's one back there. Good evening. How you doing? Um, how is this in from my house? On my campus and a lot of other places, 
lives in the not so much dollars, but the idea is that the, that the automatic assumption that everybody in the room is Christian, mm -hmm. right? So how do you, yeah. uh, uh, as a Christian, how do you, how would I, you know, uh, move forward the dialogue without yeah. having that assumption? Yeah. Even, even, even if there is a room for a Christian. Right. 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 That's a great question. Thank you for that. So, so in certain in certain places, there there might be an assumption that everybody in the room is of a particular religious tradition because that's the way it has long been in that in that locality, right? And and how how might you uh, correct that? That's a that's a great. So, so I have one word and then many words. My one word is gently. Right, you 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 address it and, and correct it gently. And, and w look, the region that we're in, Atlanta, is one of the most religiously diverse regions in in the country and therefore in the Western Hemisphere. Right, like like I know this because a bunch of my people moved down here like in the last twenty years. So y'all are diverse in part because of us, you know, <laughs> in part, not entirely, but in part. Right. Um, in fact, I was talking to my dad today, and he's like, Atlanta, huh? I'm like, yeah, he's like, there's a lot of kojas there. I'm like, there are, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so, and this is, I think this is one of the reasons, this is one of the reasons that young folks have a, have a major role to play, right? Like, there's being a digital native, y'all are diversity natives, you know? Like, this is just like normal for you to, to come up with this. And so, for folks who are not, necessarily native to a world of diversity in the same way. I just think, I, I always think beauty beats, uh, um, beauty beats argument. And I think one of the ways to kind of tell the story is, is when you're on stage or facilitating a space or whatever is, is you tell stories that you admire about communities or traditions that are maybe outside of the community or the tradition that has had a long and deep history in that place. And in that way, you make those folks feel included and you educate other folks about who else might be, who else might be in the room. But it's so one of the reasons that we think that college campuses are gonna be the, you know, IFYC's 30-year mission isn't interfaith cooperation in college campuses. It's interfaith cooperation as a social norm across the country. We think that campuses are the best laboratory and launching pad for that, which is to say that you know, your ultimate mission as an interfaith leader doesn't end on graduation day, right? We actually have uh, 35 uh, alum in this room right now. So over the past several years of our programs, and this is kind of our vanguard group of several hundred alums, and part of what they're talking about is how wherever they are, in the, in the media companies they work for, in the foundations that they work for, in the, in the, in the medical field, how they're an interfaith leader in, in the work that they're doing now, right? Just like if you become a human rights activist or an environmentalist in college, that doesn't stop on graduation day. So this is all to say that you guys have a huge role. The ecologies you're building on your college campus, those will be beacons for generations, right? Of, of students on that campus, but also for the surrounding community. And the skills, the knowledge base, the frameworks you're learning now, those are gonna be useful to you, uh, and, and I think to the nation and the world for, for a very, very long time. Um, I wanna say one more thing, which is, uh, actually I'll say two more things, which is that this doesn't exist, literally, without uh, the Coca-Cola Company, without the Woodruff Foundation, without the Glenn family, without uh, the, uh, the foundation that does a lot of great stuff in Atlanta, whose name I will never get right sequentially. That's exactly the. Uh, and so a huge, a huge, huge thank you to you all for that. And here's the final thing that I wanna say, is uh, to go back to Martin Luther King Jr. I just wanna quote from you the last two lines of his Palm Sunday sermon in 1959. So, you know, the King's admiration for Gandhi is well known. Uh, it's not so well known that King actually goes to India in 1959 to study Gandhi's Satyagraha movement. And the Mahatma had been dead for over 10 years at that point, but Gandhi was so moved by that movement that he wanted to, to see it up close. And what astounded King 
uh, was that it wasn't just a Hindu movement. You know, Satyagraha is a Hindu concept, meaning love force or soul force that Gandhi actually gets originally from the Jain tradition, right? But the movement that Gandhi puts together was Hindu and Muslim and Sikh and Jain and Christian and, and secular humanists like Nehru was. And so King comes back to his pulpit in Montgomery, Alabama in 1959, and he preaches this sermon on Gandhi as the most Christ-like figure of the 20th century. And he ends the sermon with these two lines. The first line is, O God, our gracious heavenly Father, we call you this name. We know some call you Brahma. We know some call you Elohim. We know some call you Allah. We know some call you the unmoved mover. Right? So here is King at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, lifting up the different names of the Holy One. Right? This beautifully powerful embrace of religious diversity. And the next line, the line that ends the sermon is King saying, who would come to the altar and take Jesus as his personal savior today? King ends with an altar call, right? He, on the one hand, has such powerful regard for religious diversity, has learned so much from it, and on the other hand, is so deeply rooted in his own tradition, is able to give clear voice to that and sees no apparent contradiction between the two. So I hope that for you, you know, I hope that in the course of these next three days and in the course of the next 50 years of your life, you develop that clarity of voice in engagement with others. You see the beauties of religious diversity and interfaith partnership, and all of us have the chance to act together. Thank you again. Thank you to the folks who helped make this happen. We Thank you, everyone. Another round of applause for Ibu.